Hello and welcome to Creating a Human Rights Culture, which aims to promote a lived awareness of the interdependency and indivisibility of human rights principles in our minds, hearts, and bodies, that is, dragged into our everyday lives. What, after all, is freedom of speech to a person who is homeless and lives in a world at war? Therefore, it is dedicated ultimately to the application of the Human Rights Triptych, which in brief consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at its center, the conventions, that is, international treaties on the right, and implementation measures on the left. Hello, I'm Joseph Franco again, and um, I'm here with um, Professor uh, Peter DeRico. He's a retired professor from the Legal Studies Department of UMass Amherst. And this is part two of our discussion on some of the struggles, uh, the twists and turns that led to the uh, um, endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So he has a uh, bunch of slides here, I think it's about 18 or so, and um, he's going to talk about them. And the title of this slideshow is The Doctrine of Christian Discovery from Genesis to U.S. Law. To U.S. Law. So um, The Doctrine of Christian Discovery. I'll throw a wrench in here at the beginning, but there's a quote from Chief Joseph that I like very much where he said that the humility and kindness of Christ is much like the spirit of the Indian. I'm sure that what has gone on, um, Christopher Columbus, according to Howard Zinn, in his People's History of the United States, said that he would cut off the ears of the Indians for the Blessed Trinity. I'm sure this is not what Christ had in mind. But let me um, stop there. The uh, show is yours, so this is the Doctrine of Christian Discovery from Genesis to U.S. Law. Uh, Go on. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. Uh, the, the doctrine of discovery, I, I imagine that everybody has heard about di the so-called discovery of the New World by Columbus. Uh, and the, the doctrine of discovery has evolved in U.S. law as the basis for what's called federal Indian law. It's actually the basis for U.S. property law. And it is the claim by the United States that it owns all of the land that was discovered. So I want to unpack that. And the subtitle from Genesis to U.S. Law is uh, a way of pointing to the beginnings of this doctrine, which is not starting, has nothing to do with Jesus. It has to do with the biblical origin story. God, the, when I refer to God, I'm talking about the God that's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and the story in the Bible, it says that God made a covenant with Abraham that gave him other people's lands, the land of the Canaanites. So we, when we remember that, we get the beginnings of the thread of the doctrine of Christian discovery. And it may seem strange to go back that far. But I want to uh, read a quote. There's, uh, uh, it's under the title of The Abyss. Um, there was a, uh, uh, Carl Schmitt was a uh, legal philosopher, political philosopher, uh, writing uh, back around the 50s. Um, and he said, and I'm just going to read this quote. You'll see it on the slide. An abyss separates us from the time when international law textbooks still spoke of Christian international law and the right of Christian nations. So according to Carl Schmitt, uh, we're on the other side of that abyss, that Christendom, the power of Christian nations, uh, is no longer the basis of international law. But what we're going to see as we go through this little presentation here is that in fact, U.S. property law is based on the biblical origin story of a promised land. And that is the way in which we can see the meaning of saying Christopher Columbus was the discoverer. So Christopher Columbus, the, his, the name Christopher is Christ bearer. All right. So we keep in mind that even the name says the origin story, bearing Christ. Now, the, the uh, Bible story about 
genesis uh, and abraham and the covenant is considered to be the part of the jewish part of the bible uh, and the christian part christ bearer is the christian part of the bible but if you've studied anything about the bible you know that it's the christians presented as an entirety the so-called old testament and the new testament tied together and that the christians took on this covenant and considered themselves to be the heirs of that covenant so that the covenant that god made with abraham in the story of genesis goes into the jewish story because abraham's firstborn son was the origin of what is became Islam. The Islamic branch claims that covenant. And when the Christians come into the picture, they came claim the covenant. So you have what I call a dysfunctional family of Abraham. You have the Abrahamic religions, all of them claiming they're the ones that got the covenant from God. And so there are wars going on, wars to this day, 2,000 years of wars. So. But I want to back up to the, just the legal yeah, yeah. doctrinal story. Pope Alexander VI, one year after Columbus made his landfall here, I think of Columbus as kind of boat people, lost, trying to find his way, lands here, thinks he's in India, always thought he had made it to India, never really changed his mind about that. But on behalf of Ferdinand and Isabella, who were king and queen of what was becoming Spain, Spain was just coming into existence. It had pushed the Moors, the Islamic... Uh, population out of the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, at the very same time that it was financing and sponsoring Columbus's voyage to the so-called New World. So Spain is in the midst of all this, and it wants to make sure that it has the property rights, because it's in, been in a dispute for a few years with Portugal over Africa and the rights to to go slave hunting in Africa, and the Pope has already approved that and said Portugal can go do this. So the Spanish don't want to be left out. And when Columbus pump comes back and says he's found this land, the Spanish go to the Pope, Alexander VI, and he issues a bull, a formal document, and just a few words out of it. He says, our beloved son, Christopher Columbus, discovered some remote islands and mainlands and we by the authority of almighty god do give grant and assign forever to the kings of castile and leon all of these countries provided this pope says they at no time have been in the actual temporal possession of any christian owner so right at the beginning the pope as the arbiter of the highest power in christendom the Pope is higher even than the kings and queens, says, okay, I'm going to, I, under my power from God, I'm going to give you that land. Just like God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you the land of the Canaanites, and it's going to be yours. And the Pope is playing out that covenant story, saying, of the power that God gave me, I am now going to give Spain these lands in the new world. Okay, it, earlier, the ones that I had referred, the papal bulls I had referred to earlier, 1452 and 1455, Pope Nicholas V had already set the precedent when he allowed Portugal to do slave trading in Africa. And he was also very explicit that this is a Christian venture. And just a few words out of the uh, bulls, the two bulls that uh, Pope Nicholas V issued, he, told, he gave permission to Portugal, the king of Portugal, to invade conquer, fight, subjugate the pagans and other infidels and enemies of Christ, and to put them into perpetual servitude to appropriate their possessions and goods. So this is the principle. God gave Abraham somebody else's land. The Pope gives Spain somebody else's land. An earlier Pope gave Portugal somebody else's land. We see this thing being developed as a theme, and so it becomes a kind of a doctrine. But it, before we get to U.S. law, one more quote from Nicholas V. He talks about the intrepid champions of the Christian faith. He's talking about the kings and queens uh, and carrying out their missions to uh, capture, invade, and so on. And he says that this is to subdue the enemies of Christ wherever they are placed, and reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. 
So we have here papal decrees approving slavery and land theft. But it's not called theft because it's called discovered. Right. And the, the, the essential point is that the peoples who are already there are pagans, heathens, and enemies of Christ. So they don't count. So now we jump ahead. 1823, that's a few hundred years, Chief Justice John Marshall, United States Supreme Court, case of Johnson against McIntosh. It's a property case. It's a case where there's competing groups of land speculators, white people, fighting over who gets to have the native land of the Piankashaw Nation, which is the area that we now call Illinois. And so Marshall says that when he makes the decision as to which group of land speculators is going to get it, and it's going to be, the, as it turns out, it's the speculators that did not go and make a deal with the native Piankashaw people. It's the speculators that were working with the U.S. government that he says have the actual title. But he says that they have the right to take possession of this land, notwithstanding the occupancy of the natives who were heathens. So Marshall repeats this directly, the same papal language. He says that the, title, the Christian people have the title unless there was a prior Christian. Then the prior Christian gets it. And Marshall says the United States have adopted that rule. So in 1823, Marshall takes this. It's unbelievable in a way, if you've never thought of it before. He takes a 500-year-old papal doctrine that was used to justify slavery and the Spanish claimed a title in the so-called New World. And he says, we are now adopting this in 1823, beginning early 19th century, we're adopting this into United States law. Joseph Story was a member of the court that made that decision. And in 1833, just a decade later, he wrote a very influential book that to this day is regarded as an important book called Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States. And Joseph Story said, this is a quote, the title of the Indians was not a right of property and dominion, but is a mere right of occupancy. We're back to thinking about Standing Rock, whose land is this? And Story says, as infidels, heathens, and savages, they were not allowed to, to possess land as sovereign and independent nations. And he says, he concludes by saying, the territory over which the natives wandered, he doesn't even say that they lived there, yeah, they, they um, used for temporary purposes, and in respect to Christians, they were deemed to be brute animals. Yes. Now, this is, these are okay. very high level. We have John Marshall, Joseph Story. These are very high level, very influential people in the development of U.S. legal system. And they are developing that doctrine at the beginning of the 19th century, which is the 500-year-old doctrine of the papal rights of Christians. And they're not making any, uh, they're not trying to cover it up. They're okay. saying it's because it's true. Christians have this right. Okay. Let's take another leap. 1954, we're getting very close now to our present time. The, the case of the Tihitan uh, versus the United States. Tihitan are in the area that you were in, the area that's called Alaska. Yes. And the U.S. government had sent in contractors to take timber, to turn it into pulpwood to print newspapers. And the Tihitan had protested and said, you're taking our timber right. and you would owe us money. And so they sued the United States. Well, the Solicitor General uh, for the United States, defending the United States against that claim that the Tihantan were making. Here, this is what was in the brief that he Wait, filed. Try to spend a minute on each slide. Yeah. I'm looking at that time. Yeah, yeah, I will. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so Sobolov says that the Christian nations of Europe acquired jurisdiction over the discovered lands by virtue of grants from the popes the power to grant to Christian monarchs the right to acquire territory in which heathens and infidels live. This is 1954. And Slobov says the natives only had a right of occupancy through the grace of the sovereign, the sovereign being the U.S. claim. So when that case was heard by the Supreme Court, Justice Stanley Reed, who was not this chief justice, but a justice of it, 
he adopted the U.S. argument, and he said it's well settled that the states of the in the states of the Union, the tribes who inhabited the lands of the states after the coming of the white man had only permission from the whites to occupy. 1954, and so they concluded the Teton get no money because they don't actually own anything, neither the land nor the timber. They just have the grace of the U.S. that they can stay there. Yeah. So now we're going to make a, a big leap. 2005, the city of Sherrill versus the Oneida Indian Nation. This is what the, what the opinion of the court was, which was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This will tell you we're not talking about this as like all liberals are somehow in favor of native rights and all conservatives are not. Ruth Bader Ginsburg starts off footnote one in her decision, says, under the doctrine of discovery, she now drops the word Christian in the 21st century. It's not permissible to remember what this is. The doctrine of discovery, title to the lands occupied by the Indians, became vested in the United States sovereign. This is 2005, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in the case of City of Sherrill versus the Oneida Indian Nation. In 2018, we're getting practically yesterday, the solicitor uh, in a case called uh, Royal v. Murphy, it was a case had to do with Creek Nation jurisdiction, he talks about the history of the U.S. in relation to the Creek Nation is an intent to dismantle the Creek Nation and abolish its tribal organization and extinguish its tribal titles. So he admits that what was being aimed at, he called, was the civil death of the Muscogee Nation. Now that language is the same language that is used in the international definition of genocide, which was developed by another lawyer, an international lawyer, uh, Raphael Lemkin, in 1944. And he says genocide means a plan of actions aiming at the destruction of the essential foundation of the life of national groups. He said the objectives are to disintegrate the political and social institutions, the national feelings, the religion, and the economic existence. That's precisely what in 2018 the U.S. solicitor said was the aim of the U.S. in regards to the Creek. And it's amazing to me that the Creek brief in that case, it hasn't yet been decided, it's actually still uh, being uh, argued inside the chambers of the judges, but it's amazing to me that the Creek Nation or anybody else called that out and said, the U.S. has just admitted that it's trying to commit genocide against the Creek Nation. And right. that this stuff happens kind of under the radar, I guess, even though it's been blatantly said by the U.S. in its brief. So also in 2018, the Yakima Nation filed an amicus brief in a case involving a uh, conflict between the state of Washington and a trucking company that is a Yakima uh, trucking company. It's not a Yakima Nation company, but it's a company that operates within the Yakima Nation. And the state of Washington was trying to prohibit them from running their trucks on highways without paying taxes to the state. And there, the Yakima Nation is the only case that I know of where at the level of the Supreme Court, a native nation has called out the doctrine of Christian discovery. And just a few words from there, the Yakima Nation referred to the religious, racist, genocidal doctrine of Christian discovery, a doctrine of domination and dehumanization. Then they said it is not welcome within Yakima territory and should no longer be tolerated in U.S. law. And they, in the brief, this is the first thing that they did, and then they secondly uh, referred to the treaty, and they say that the solemn promises made in the treaty between the U.S. and the Yakima Nation is the actual relationship, not the so-called power of Christian discovery. And when that case was decided, uh, this uh, just was recently, okay. it was decided in favor of the Yakima Nation, and here again, just to confound people who are thinking about you know, liberal and conservative, Neil Gorsuch wrote the opinion saying that the Yakima Nation Treaty guaranteed their right to travel and not pay uh, taxes to the state of Washington. And he says that if the state and the federal governments don't like the terms of the treaty, they can try to bargain for more. But they do not have the power 
to actually just override the treaty. He doesn't deal with Christian discovery. There were two yes. favorable opinions. They refer to the Yakima Nation brief, but only in relation to the part with the treaty. And my sense is the strategy the Yakima Nation used actually was, it was uh, successful, which is they present a brief. They say the court has two roads it can go down. One, it can go down Christian discovery, and they call it out, and they reject it. And the other is it can go down with the treaty. And when you read the opinions of the, of the court, they are not going to touch that live wire of Christian discovery and actually have to deal with it. Instead, they embrace the treaty. And the dissent, the part of the Supreme Court that dissented, they don't want to name Christian discovery, but they are there mired in that same old doctrine that the U.S. has some kind of you know, superior uh, power here. And so just to bring it right to a conclusion, this is a language from Genesis. This is Genesis 12, 1, verses 6 to 7, and 15, verses 18 to 21, if you didn't want to track it down. And this is the New International Version language. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, and I will show you other land. He says, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. And then the Bible actually mentions all the people, the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, names all the people who live there that God says, it doesn't matter. They're there, but I'm giving you this land. And in Judges 2, another book of the Bible, the angel of the Lord said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land but you shall break down their altars. You have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? So this is not only a colonial God that gives the land, but when the people move into the land and they coexist, God gets angry. And so they're going to be chastised. Is this still Palestine? Is this what the call This is in the same, exactly. This is this where is we're we talking call. about. This is the roots of where the Palestine-Israeli Israel is, is happening. I, I and by the way, when, since yeah, Palestinians and Israelis are I'm all Semites. Semites. You can't right. say that it's anti-Semitic to talk about the conflict between them. Yes. Um, I just want to say that you see already from these recent cases that this is still considered valid law, that uh, just a month ago I did a quick search on legal database called Westlaw, yes. and there are 349 cases citing Johnson against McIntosh, and the most recent one was in March 22, to uh, 2019. So this is this is considered to be valid U.S. law, and so the right to the UN uh, declaration, the rights of indigenous people, has also taken this head on, and it says the, that the doctrine of <coughs> the doctrine of uh, Christian discovery is racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable, socially unjust. I think that uh, if you want to follow us this up. Uh, you can look at a couple of books that Steve Newcomb, uh, my colleague, has done, one called Pagans in the Promised Land, and a video he's put out called uh, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. So that's, I guess when the, this uh, show is edited, those slides will be presented and people can, can uh, see for themselves without having to just hear me read this. Yeah, well, I'll do my best. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Uh, I'll do my best. But um, that, so that was leaves us a couple of minutes. But... Uh, articulate and well, well said. One thing you forgot um, on your slide, I have them in front of me. Yeah, that you're asking people to petition Pope Francis to rescind the papal bulls from the 15th century. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you want to talk about that. Let me just that. say, that's, kind I'm of glad you brought guy. that up. Uh, yeah, I think so, there, there's actually a, a quite widespread movement, uh, particularly in the U.S. and Canada, uh, petitioning the Vatican to rescind the papal bulls. It's been going on for a while. Uh, the Vatican claims that uh, the bull no longer means anything, that it was superseded by later bulls, but it has never actually been rescinded. I want to say that's fine as far as that goes, but what I'm talking about is U.S. law. Let's say that Francis decided that, yep, we're going to rescind that bull, that 15th century uh, bull that said Christians can go enslave heathens and pagans. It's no longer going to be allowed to be Vatican doctrine. That does not mean that the U.S. 
law has changed yeah u s law it's is where if you know from my perspective it's not wrong to ask the vatican to rescind it but the proper target has to be the operation of the doctrine in u s law which is why the yakima nation amicus brief in washington versus coover den is so crucial is that they made that challenge within the u s legal system and they say they're rejecting that and that it has no place in governing the Yakima Nation. That's where the crucial action is. Right. Um, well, I think if they do, if Pope Francis does rescind it, um, maybe it'll eventually seep into our it would be a symbolic very, yes, consciousness. Yes, indeed. But after a long, long it would be time. a it would be a very powerful act to do. Even though, even if you want to say, oh, it would only be symbolic because it didn't change U.S. law, but it would make you. You talked about shame and blame or something that sort yeah, of. Right, that's that's the, the same. Thing. That same force is working here. The Yakima Nation calls this out. Uh, it seemed pretty clear to me the the court is suddenly put on notice. Uh, you're going to have to wade in some thorny thickets here if you want to go down that path. Okay, we have about a minute and a half left. Um, okay, any advice for uh, the viewers? Uh, what what can we do um, to improve the quality of life um, in general and or for indigenous people? Uh, and yeah. Any final words? You've been with us for close to two hours now, and I wonder if you have any. Well, I would. Uh, I guess I'd say what we've talked about already is that uh, do do some homework. Figure out that uh, when you start with basic concepts that are confused and contradictory, you're not going to get anywhere. So try to pare back. If you want to talk about uh, mascots. Okay, talk about mascots, but uh, what, uh, in fact, let me, let me say, if you want to talk, if you're in Massachusetts, you want to talk about the state seal, because that's now another yeah. movement, let's change the state seal. Let's be clear, the bill that's actually in the legislature is setting up a commission to study the state seal, and the charge of the commission is to show how, that if you misunderstood that, that was, uh, that seal, that was uh, unintended, and that the Commonwealth has always been dedicated to justice. And I'm thinking, well, if that's your starting point, your study is already prejudiced. You're not going to really look at the history of Massachusetts. And I feel more like it's better to leave the seal and maybe put a stamp on it saying, what's wrong with this picture? It's like the, the Confederate generals. Got it. Look at them. Thank Think you. about it. Got it. We got to okay. stop. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, take care of yourselves and take care of others as needs be. Hope to see you again. Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you.